We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Up, bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing and the freaks are coming out now. Welcome to AEW Unrestricted. I'm Will Washington. She is Aubrey Edwards. Aubrey, how are you doing today? You just knocked your hat off? I did knock my hat off. I was so excited and dancing to our theme music that I uh, I definitely just knocked my hat off. So definitely watch the video version of AEW Unrestricted. Uh, new episodes every Monday on our YouTube channel. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you know, um, the things that have been knocking people's hats off, our guest today, we'll get to her in a second. But also, uh, AEW Collision, we've officially reached one year of what? Collision. This Saturday is the one year anniversary of Collision. Mm. This is, this is insane. Now you're going to tell me that we're almost halfway through 2024. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because the show started last June. June 17th was the first episode. God. Here we are now coming up on another. Uh, we're going to enter year two of Collision. It's been a year of, you know, I, Saturdays are so interesting, right? Because I don't think people realize how much fun goes into Saturday wrestling and how it is a more laid back environment than Wednesdays. It's a different vibe. Yeah. It's kind of hard to describe. Like I know I'm a Wednesday girly and I love my Wednesday boys and it's all great, but I'm not going to lie. Every time I pop on over to a Saturday on collision, like I have a blast. Yeah. It's great. There's just something more about wrestling on a Saturday night, how it's just more laid back, more chill, but everyone's just still really excited to be there. And it's just incredible. And I can't believe it's been a whole year. <laughs> I'm mostly a Wednesday person too. I pop in on Saturdays. I think, Maybe half the time I'm there mm -hmm. and every single time it's like, this is a vibe. Saturdays are truly a vibe. So it's it's really cool that we've reached one year of this product and it's going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to evolve. Uh, of course, Collision has the shows in Arlington coming up this summer. Um, those are going to be great. Check those out if you haven't gotten a chance to get your tickets and you're in the area. AEWTIX.com is where those are. You know, Saturdays are a time where we get to experiment with certain things. You get to see certain wrestlers try out mm -hmm. you also get to see them deliver their new presentations in a way and yeah. one of those people got to do that this week and that happens to be our guest yes who is our guest today will a guest that at one point was a fan favorite probably just a month ago would have been overjoyed to have on this show but has Ugh. recently <laughs> drawn the ire of the aew fans and for the first time in her AEW career has done so, joining us now is more than a woman, Chris Statlander. And Boots. Yeah, Boots She's, is there. And Bo oh, Boots is here. She's muzzling. Oh, wow. You know, that's funny because uh, that's something that's been asked about a lot is did boots also turn <gasps> she's neutral <laughs> she's uh, she's switzerland <laughs> yeah she's Sweden. just kind of chilling you know she's just like whoever will give me bugs and i respect that about her she's got one motive only what is boots boots is an iguana right She's a bearded dragon. Bearded yeah. dragon, that's what it is. Get her right, Will. All right, I'm signing off. Disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> bearded dragon, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, she, Boots. How dare you? She just buried herself even more. She's upset. <laughs> Not on Will Washington's side, that's for sure. <laughs> Let's address the elephant in the room, which is uh, not in the room today. But uh, I want to start by talking about Stokely Hathaway. And that is a relationship that started this past December, a series of segments that... Uh, led into World's End, basically blossomed into a relationship that fans fell in love with and then recently grew to hate. I want to talk about how that relationship evolved. H how did this come to be? A harassment, basically. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he kept showing up in my life. He wouldn't leave me alone. Wouldn't stop texting, wouldn't stop calling. I had to block his number for a little bit. But, you know, at, at one point I decided to hear him out just to, you know, hopefully get him off my back. And he just kind of clinged on to the small amount of leeway that I gave him, like a leech. You just kind of start to coexist together after a bit. So, and the, here, here we are. Well, you know, it's interesting because I went back and rewatched that first segment that took place in which he did make a lot of the same points that it seems like you're making today against your friends or former friends. You know, he talked about how you're not going to get ahead with people like Orange Cassidy. I believe he used the words uh, bitch-ass Danhausen yeah. and, of course, Willow Nightingale. And sure enough, 
these are the same things you're saying today. It feels like he kind of got through to you. I wouldn't say I'm saying the same things as he said, because he's at a much more aggressive and rude way. <laughs> I think my reasoning for why I did things is, you know, he just said that they're behind me, basically, to kind of shorten it. And I'd say that it's not that they were behind me. It's that they kept taking things from me and taking my time and my energy and not giving me the chance to kind of shine on my own that because I always had to make sure everyone else was okay, that no one really took the time to make sure I was okay. At some point, you just got to cut those people off. And that's what I had to do. So in a way, it's similar to what he said, but there's more reasoning in within me for my actions. And yeah, deal with it. <laughs> There's a, it, it's more or less he kind of opened your eyes into you needing to put yourself first, it sounds like. Yeah, I'd say sometimes it's easy, especially in wrestling when you fight everyone that you're friends with at one point, whether you want to or not. You kind of um, develop like a rose colored glasses to a lot of things where even though, you know, we physically hurt each other, maybe emotionally we don't, but sometimes the physicality gets added up and, you realize there's moments that start to you start to notice like in those matches and you're like, oh, they try to take advantage of me right there. And at some point you have to learn to not stand for that anymore and you have to start sticking up for yourself. So Stokely's sort of been in your corner for a couple months now and you guys are now sort of presenting a unified front. The things he's been saying, you're now saying a little more succinctly and a little less annoyingly. <laughs> what has sort of... <laughs> I write? <laughs> How has sort of the relationship or friendship with Stokely grown sort of in this these last, I guess, few weeks or so since this big moment happened at Double or Nothing? I'd say it's still, first and foremost, very business-related. It's not like we're hanging out much outside of work. I saw you guys at Chuck E. Cheese. I disagree. Well, listen, that was <laughs> a party. That's different. <laughs> I, okay. We're not going out to brunch and getting mimosas together. I, I'd say, so that's why first and foremost, I'd say it's business related. In a way, he, he kind of needs me there for him because he loves to run his mouth. <laughs> you know, he bites off more than he can chew sometimes. But it, it's nice to almost be needed because I know that he can't defend himself where everyone else who was taking advantage of me, they could, and they were just kind of using my ability as like an extra leap up on the competition. But he is like a defenseless <laughs> child and he, he needs me. <laughs> so I am willing to be there because he has gotten me a lot of opportunities. And That's true. I feel like it's a, a respectful return for what he has done for me, I'd say. Although I really wish he would stop calling out people like Brody King because I can't fight everyone. And I'm trying to not die. So that'd be great. That is absolutely fair. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about the uh, recently you were announced as the first entry, uh, though you weren't alone for very long because about an hour later we had three entries in. But you were the yeah. first entry in the 2024 the Owen Hart Foundation tournament. Yes. I want to talk about the decision to open uh, into the tournament and kind of what that means for you, uh, because if I remember correctly, this isn't necessarily an opportunity you've had before. Well, yeah. But that's not true. You were in the first. I wasn't supposed to be, though. Right. That's what the kind of salt in the wound is a little bit, is that I was a backup plan. That's right. For the first one. Mm. Second one, I was a champion at the time, but I still don't see why I couldn't have, you know, just gone for it. Might as well, you know, add another notch in my belt, but... You know, it's fine. People were too intimidated because I was on a winning streak at that time. Um, so this is the first time I'm actually entering in the tournament as a meant to be there contestant. And I am not taking that lightly because I had, again, like I said, the first time I was a backup plan. They didn't even want me in it the first time. The second time they were too afraid to put me in it because they knew that I would win basically. And the third time, third time's a charm. So what would it mean to you to win this tournament? Because the winner of this tournament does get to face for the championship at Wembley Stadium this summer. I mean, it means that I will become practically the first person to have won TBS, Owen Hart Foundation tournament, and the Women's World Championship if I win this tournament. That sounds pretty good to me. I don't know why I wouldn't want to take advantage of that opportunity. You did make it quite far. You made it to the semifinals of that first one. You made it to Ruby Soho, mm -hmm. Las Vegas. I remember that event 
vividly. I think a lot of people remember that event vividly. It was an yes, episode so of Rampage. <laughs> that was actually my first time ever main eventing for AEW. Oh. It's special to me in a lot of ways. Even though I did not win, there's a lot of things about that day that kind of were a turning point for me. Uh, well, one of the things that was a big turning point was the fans that night. Yeah. Because in that particular moment, the fans had decided Chris Statlander was our girl. Mm -hmm. Ruby Soho was absolutely not. Did you anticipate that reaction going into that match? Not at all. Because also before that match, that was the first time I was also really given the chance to cut a promo. It's really speaking from the heart because that was back when we still did the um, pre-main event promos. The two box. The two box. The three boxes. Uh, yes. Slash two box. You know, multi box. However many boxes. <laughs> <laughs> the multi-box <laughs> promos. <laughs> and that was the first time I really got a chance to speak from the heart and people really got to hear what I had to say and they wanted to hear what I had to say. And I think that kind of set the tone for everything else that was to come. So yeah, like I said, that was a very special day for me because one, this is the first time I got to really tell my thoughts. I got to main event for the first time. The fans really were like, this is our guy, our girl, whatever you want to say. So it was it was a good day. It was a good day for me. Even though I didn't get the win. Like I said, I wasn't supposed to be in that tournament. It would have been really nice to kind of show everyone why I was supposed to be. And even though I did not win, I think I still did accomplish that. That's true. It was it was a really good match. I was so, so upset backstage <laughs> at the time watching my girl lose. It's funny how how things things happen and when you look back and see how things have have turned out. Anyway, we are talking to Chris Salander here on AEW Unrestricted. More coming up soon. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Will talking to more than a woman, Chris Statlander, along with her uh, special guest, Boots. If you're watching the video version, Boots is adorable and wonderful and is also acting as neutral in Chris's new outlook on life, I guess we could say. Not an iguana, by the way. Bearded dragon. Not an iguana. Definitely a bearded dragon. Will is learning a lot yeah, about... And if you say it, you're next <laughs> on the hit list. <laughs> Oh my God. So we've actually had you on this podcast twice before. Correct. And then the second time we had you on was after your first knee surgery. Yes. So this is technically us having you on after your second knee surgery, which uh, kind of segues into what I want to talk about. Double or Nothing has been kind of this really big uh, show for Chris Statlander, not only just for AEW, but huge moments in mm -hmm. sort of your career and establishing you as both a wrestler and such a major part of the AEW roster. So last year you returned from your second knee injury and you ultimately ended up winning the TBS championship. Correct. So you ended up winning against Jade's, you know, 60 win undefeated streak. You got the title. It was this really great moment. Everyone was so happy to see you at the time. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like to come back to that sort of reception and to walk out of Vegas as a champion? Well, I first just want to say, the day that we are recording this is the four-year anniversary of my first knee injury. Whoa! Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's the four-year anniversary from the first ACL tear happened on this day. I, I definitely remember that because you you had the match of Double or Nothing, and then it was like, yeah. hey, Chris Statlander's on a roll, and then suddenly... <sighs> she's now she's on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, to come back from my second knee injury to the Vegas crowd, it was a nightmare of a day for me because, or I purposely asked to not be in the hotel in the casino because I didn't want anyone to know that I was there, even though it was kind of like people were speculating it at that point. However, I wanted to take any risk of um, people seeing me there. So I stayed in like a very, not good hotel. <laughs> that's just in Vegas, that can mean so many things too. There, that's a wide range. I know. It was, it, was, it was fine. I know I had a handicap room, so there's plenty of room for me to roll around in my room out of boredom. I got there the night before, and then they didn't want to pick me up until like closer to the show time. So I was just sitting in my room all day, just panicking, waiting to hear from somebody about who's going to come and get me. And I, I had drank too much caffeine before I had even gotten to the building. You know, the anticipation of waiting to go and make my actual return. I like for something that was so quick, I remember like my heart rate tracker was, it said that I had like a high level, like cardiovascular activity for like an hour. Cause I was just like panicking 
not panicking, but I was just like, is my first match back? The second knee injury. And then I was going for a title right away. I was nervous. I was so nervous. But then every time, like as soon as you step into the crowd, as soon as you get out on the stage, it all those nerves always go away for me. That's it's always when I'm standing on the stairs to go and do my entrance. That's where I'm nervous and and I want to die. <laughs> but then I get on stage and then I'm like, oh, never mind. I'm good. I'm cool. To go so long without it too. Yeah. Like it's almost like you forget that that feeling hits as soon as you get through the curtain because it had been so long since the fans had seen you at that point. Yeah. I, I can very much understand that feeling of being backstage and those nerves and the build up and kind of you knowing what was coming as long as you knew what was coming, but the fans mm -hmm. didn't. And that thought of how it would be received. Yeah. I have conversations with people often about them talking themselves out of things simply because they think the fans won't receive it well. And it's like, as soon as you get out there, you know, it's going to be good. Yeah. And then I also like, I remember I did like a new pose on my entrance and I lost my balance and I was like, this is all downhill. It's I'm, I'm done. I'm <laughs> and I was like, it's all, this is my big return. Goodbye, Kristen. This is it. <laughs> no, but everything else was fine. But I was just like, great. This had happened. My big return and I'm losing my balance and I'm going to fall. This is great for me. I'm so cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> but instead, uh, you did win the TBS title that night. I second ever TBS champion. That's right. And you went on to have quite a reign with the belt, uh, a very different reign than the first reign. So, I, I, I want to talk about, you know, what that meant to you winning a championship in your first night back and. Uh, especially being somebody who's been with AEW since the beginning, but hadn't had a championship up to that point. And I'd say for a long time, there were people really screaming, mm -hmm. Chris Statlander should have been champion. Chris Statlander should have won. Mm -hmm. A whole three years later, the moment finally came for you. Uh, so what did that feel like? What was that like? It was, it was really nice because it wasn't, you know, I had fought for the AEW Women's World Championship a couple of times, um, fought against it, against um, Riho, Nyla, Britt. All Out 2021. Correct. Yes. yes. And Revolution 2020 yes. uh, was when I fought it against, against Nyla. I don't think I fought against or fought for it any other time. But I, I had gone for it uh, quite a few times that I had to constantly like, you know, in between those times, it was the build myself up to be worthy and to get the title shot and then lose it. And then I had to rebuild myself to get another title shot. And then I blew out my knee. And then I had to recover from that. And then I had to show everyone that I wasn't injury prone. And then I still had to rebuild my repertoire and show that I could go for a title and then prove that I deserved the, to win the title. And then still didn't win the title, blew out my knee again, had to rebuild myself all over again. And by that time, after I had lost the big one multiple times, I also lost the TBS title tournament in that time. I lost the Owen Hart Foundation tournament in that time as well. So there's a lot of big ones that I missed out on. And by the time I was coming back from my second knee surgery, I was not wasting any more time to take that chance. And I had to take that opportunity right then and there at Double or Nothing 2023. It felt so good because it kind of felt like all those losses, all the injuries, everything mentally I struggled with was finally worth. Oh, there's boots. <laughs> you really got to watch the video version of this, by the way. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> he just sings down and then he just pops back up. <laughs> but it, it felt like everything that I had been through, it finally paid off. And it was finally, all those struggles were finally worth it because I had finally had a physical representation of victory and overcoming everything that I have. So it, it meant a lot to me and to know that like I was set to be entrusted to be the face of AEW and of TBS. It was, it was a big, it was a very big moment for me. It was awesome because we always talk about how we want people as, as fans, we want people who, who have titles to be the ones who have earned it. Right. And it's hard to say, mm -hmm. how can you say someone's earned it if they haven't even been on TV, but people may not know how hard Chris Statlander works. Like I remember there was, you were like a week out from your last knee surgery and you were already back on the road rehabbing. Like I went to the gym in the hotel room one day and you're there like starting like very basic stretches. <laughs> I'm like, girl, you are taking no time off. You're like, nope, got to get back. I know. To see kind of all of that happen and to know that you are putting in the work to get back to it after having 
already gone through this whole process once with one knee and now doing it again with another knee. Mm -hmm. It's like, in my mind, there was no question that it made the most sense that you come back and you win the title because who works harder than Chris Statlander? Like, of course she should be TBS champion. Well, that's very, very kind of you to say. It, it's hard to kind of like measure yourself to other people, especially with injuries, because everyone in wrestling goes through injuries and everyone has their own journey to come back from it and feel comfortable with it again. And, and again, like coming back from the second one, I was like, let's let's get it going. I got I got things to do. The first one, I was a lot more hesitant. But again, I was we were in Jacksonville by the time I returned and I was doing football drills on the Daly's place field and stuff. I, because of, we just had to wait to clear me. I, it was, it's not that I wasn't ready. It's just, I wasn't allowed to be cleared yet. So we were just having me do ladder drills and shuttle runs and sled pulls on the football field, just waiting to, to get me cleared. Like, again, I don't like to say that like I work the hardest because everyone works hard in their own ways. And we never know what people are kind of dealing with in their journeys. Cause there is a lot of injuries are a lot more mental than they are physical but I am at least very thankful that even though I hated having to blow out both my knees and recover from them, uh, I've had quite a few people reach out to me about their knee and leg injuries. And I'm just happy to be someone that's there to uh, kind of walk them through it and give them some advice uh, and just let them know that there is light at the end of the tunnel because I didn't believe that light was there for a while. But I, I got through it. Here I am it's so easy to get negative and to kind of just be like, I'm done with wrestling because this is the worst feeling I've ever had in the, in the world. So it's nice to, you know, be, be a mental advocate, I guess. Um, but also kind of a physical one because now I'm like unofficially a part of the medical team with helping other people <laughs> rehab from their injuries in the ring. And it, it's nice because it's kind of my fault that not my fault, but I was kind of like the prototype in a way for the recovery process and the return to sport procedure. Yes. Yeah. Because of me constantly showing up to work, even when I didn't have to um, and wanting to rehab with them and wanting to find like good steps and give feedback with the medical team about like, Hey, this might be too much at this point. And Hey, I think we can start progressing a little bit more. It, it's just been nice to know that like, I've been able to help out in other ways besides just what's on screen. Man, that's really cool. Like genuinely. Right? Well, especially to to get to because, you know, your injury happens uh, at such an early part in the company's history that to kind of get to yeah. find some good in those injuries and to find, to get to be a part of building a process out and building a new process. Um, that's got to be a little bit rewarding in finding some silver lining in what took place. So that's uh, actually really cool to learn. Yeah, it definitely is, especially because I am technically a licensed massage therapist and I don't practice because I wouldn't want people to just randomly want a massage, you know, that's weird. <laughs> but it, it's nice to still like have like some sort of medical aspect, a part of my work, even though I had to kind of, go through injuries and figure it out and then help everyone else figure it out. And I feel like now everyone's feeling a lot more prepared once they come back from their injuries. So it's nice to say that I was kind of like the groundwork for that. I love that. And we've got more conversation here with our dear friend, Chris Statlander, right here when AEW Unrestricted continues. All right, everyone, we are back. It is Chris Statlander here, and I am with Aubrey Edwards and Will Washington and my bearded dragon boots, and they're going to ask me some more questions. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, good job. All right, Chris Statlander. Wow. Uh, I, I want to talk about this transformation of yours that you've gone through just recently. Again, because it's kind of a new experience for you, is it not in AEW at least? Yeah. You are not a fan favorite. You are not a baby face, as it were. Uh, you walked yeah. through the other tunnel. Uh, How can this even be? How does that even feel? I remember walking out with you at Double or Nothing, and for the first time, you have to just ignore the fans because these aren't these aren't your people anymore. Yeah. How's it been? Felt good. <laughs> <laughs> we have too many opinions, and if it's not good and it's not about me, I don't want it. Oh, I mean, and, and so it's all really come together, uh, and. You know, last week on Collision, you got to debut the new entrance, um, which looked really dope. The, you've got the take on me yes. style with the Tron, but then also, or at the video wall, 
But then also, I don't think you even knew the silhouette was happening. But like, no, I, I watched it back after my match, and I was like, "Oh, this is pretty cool." Or they they had told me about it, and I, I I didn't I didn't hear the song until that day. I didn't see the the video until that day. I didn't know anything that was going on. I was just like, was, I remember I was watching, and I was like, "If I didn't have this, I'd be pissed. I'd be so <laughs> jealous." <laughs> so I'm glad that it's me that gets it. So. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. I had heard the song a few days prior. Mm-hmm. It was like I had to really picture you and picture how you were going to present yourself. You know, it, it's amazing how a song can come together once the wrestler actually uses it. So I, I, th- I thought it was really cool, and I, I, I really liked all of it. But um, that you. was actually a really cool Saturday altogether to watch it happen all for the first time. It felt like there was a lot of pressure on it because I knew it was a big um revamp of who i am you know you want it to look good and sound good and you want people to be like oh this is this is her now and the full version that on the day that we we're recording it with all the added lyrics and just came out today and it's so cool mm-hmm. it, it's cool that people were able to kind of interpret everything i had went through and what i was feeling and to put it into a kick-ass song <laughs> so i'm i've listened to it so many times today has proven to it. But it was also, it also would have been nice to hear it a little bit a few days in advance so I could kind of like, because the poses and stuff that I had done on the new entrance, I had thought about it a while ago because I knew that it was going to, things are going to be different. Um, so I was just like, oh, cool. and then I didn't even, like, I totally forgot and I was, I just did them when we were doing it and I was like, yeah, that actually worked out well. So it would have been really embarrassing <laughs> if they, uh, didn't go well together. <laughs> well, I would have been like, oh, I gotta think of something else to do now. Oh boy. So we've we've seen various different iterations of Chris Statlander when you first came to AEW, sort of this alien, otherworldly type person, and then coming back as more than a woman, and now you're sort of this mm-hmm. huge jerk with, you know, Stokely in your back pocket because he is very small and that's where he fits. Yes. But where do we kind of see Chris Statler Lander going from here. Obviously, you're uh, in the Owen Hart Cup tournament this summer. I imagine you expect to win and then eventually go to Wembley and win the women's championship. Mm -hmm. I expect all of that. But as you as a person and as a wrestler and someone who has grown at AEW, who we've seen grow at AEW, who do you kind of see yourself becoming over the next few months, years, forever? I'd say I'd see myself becoming a can't miss TV kind of person mm. you know every out of even though i've done so much already i feel like there's so much that i have not even like attempted to touch yet whether it's title related or not i just know that there's so much more that i'm capable of doing and i i feel like i'm finally reaching that point in my presentation and my career and my confidence uh that people are finally seeing like oh she's got it now because even with like the the past couple promos that i've done people are like oh my god she's she can cut a good promo and i'm like well i could have this whole time but i i haven't really had a chance again like from that one time back in 2021 i haven't really had a whole lot of chances to like truly speak from the heart and express myself and i was i've been able to write down what i'm feeling and tell it to people and they can interpret it however they want but this is me talking everything that i've said so far is my own words. And I'm very proud that people are so responsive and receptive of it. Because I, again, like this whole time, I've had the whole full package deal. It's hard to show that sometimes when you, we have a lot of people that have the full package deal. There's a lot of people that are fantastic wrestlers, fantastic promos, just fantastic talents all around. And it's hard to kind of like pinpoint that and nitpick and show who's who when we all have so much to offer um so it's nice that i'm finally finding my way to kind of like shine through a little bit more well being that this is aw unrestricted it couldn't be unrestricted if we didn't pull back the curtain a little bit and so uh there is a a big question i actually wanted to ask you oh boy because uh there was a stat uh put out there by some fans on social media that you went 95 days between singles matches. Yeah. And so where you are today is something that, you know, had been kind of in the works for quite some time. And it was something that we knew was coming. And it was something that when the time was right, we were going to present you in this new way, in in a way that you've never seen Chris Statlander before. 
But 95 yeah. days is a very long time. And as, as you know, I, it, it was very hard on me to. And that, that was what I wanted to ask you about was yeah. some of the anxiety that, that comes with going that long with um, essentially having to be in the background. Now you're in the background with, with a knife to somebody's back. You know, it's, people <laughs> sensed what was coming, but you. You were driving to... me crazy. Yeah. Like, what was I going to do? You know? but, but you were in the background for quite some time. Can you kind of talk about some of the emotions around that and the anxiety leading to finally getting to that moment? I don't know if it's so much anxiety, but I would say I felt, I, and I don't want to say I felt forgotten because I was involved in many things. And even though it wasn't singles matches, I was doing tags and I was still participating, but it was so not consistent and infrequent. What was really hard about a lot of it is that these were a lot of the same feelings that I was feeling when I was recovering from my injuries, because we all get in our heads when we're under injuries about, especially my first one, I was like, oh, everyone's thriving. They don't need me anymore. I, I probably should just quit because Damn. what do I have to offer at this point? And it took a lot of people to kind of like really, I don't want to say regain my confidence, but it takes a lot for me to get fully confident in anything. But it took a lot of people to help me see that I am not just someone to brush aside and that people do want me there. People do care. So it, it was very difficult because it was like kind of going back into those dark times. And I, and I knew that that wasn't the case. And I knew that there were things to come, but when you're really not doing anything, even though it's such a hectic lifestyle that we live, um, it really gets very obvious when you're not doing anything because you're doing so much and then you do nothing. So it, it was hard, but we got through it. And I still have that fire in me that I want to do more uh, because I, I love, I truly love wrestling so much. I love the physicality of it. And like, there's nothing I love more than being at work with people that I used to love and that I hate now <laughs> and other people that I have found comfort in now. Again, it's part of the job. We have limited time every week. Sometimes it's just not your time. And it's hard. It's so hard to accept that when you felt like and it was forced to not be your time for so long, so many times before. So it was just difficult for me. It was tough. It was not a good time. Not a good time, but it is a good time whenever you're here with us on Unrestricted. So thanks for being here, Chris. You love me. Yes, we do. We, we do. I'm I'm upset at a number of things that have happened over the course of the last few weeks, but it can't not be recognized how hardworking you are and how you can't get enough. <laughs> you just really, and it's like, man, I really hate that I like working with her so much because she's kind of a bitch now, and we have to deal with that Stokely guy. And ugh. what you don't know is that this is actually how I act all the time. <laughs> Great, this is truly. My my true behavior all the time. We're we're seeing the true Chris Statlander. This is oh no, so annoying. <laughs> Just so you annoying. Don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can watch this really annoying person on television <laughs> on Dynamite on Wednesdays on TBS, Rampage on Fridays on TNT, and Collision on Saturdays on TNT. Definitely tune in to all of the places AEW, listen to this podcast Thursdays on all of your favorite podcast platforms, and watch the video and see the adorable, amazing boots, the bearded dragon on the video versions, which come out Monday. Yeah, there, there she is. Oh, she's so cute. I am Aubrey Edwards with my co host, Will Washington. Thank you so much for being here today and listening to us talk to Chris Statlander on AEW Unrestricted. Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted, got the house now. We gon' turn it up, up, bring the house down. Got that big space pumping, make them bounce now. Flossing like they bossing in the 